triathletes are among the healthiest demographic there is, right? I mean, we're the best of the best. And, and you know, I kind of feel like Martin Luther King today. I have a dream because I believe we can be better than we are. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. Good. Awesome. Really uh, thankful first to Eric and Mark for having me here today. And thank you to all of you for coming. And I believe because you're here, you and I believe the same things. And, and that's really what today's about. Why am I here? Why are you here? And why are we doing this to ourselves? Now, I'll tell you why I'm here. I'm here because I believe we can be better than we are. Right? I really do. This Krishnamati quote, I think, represents a pretty profound thought. I mean, when we think about our society today, triathletes are among the healthiest demographic there is, right? I mean, we're the best of the best. We cross-train, right? We, we do many sports. We're, we're doing a lot of different things. But I believe that despite the fact that we're the best of the best in our society, there's a lot of things that we could, do, we could do a lot better. You know, in our gait analysis lab at Pursuit Athletic Performance, we work with athletes every day that are broken. And, and you know, I kind of feel like Martin Luther King today. I have a dream. I've got a dream, folks. What's my dream? That perhaps, maybe in a year or two, not seven out of ten of you will be injured this year from your sport. Maybe finishing an Ironman won't mean that you've got an arthritic hip or knee for the rest of your life, right? Maybe we can train in a way that enhances balance in our lives and balance in our bodies, and maybe we can train in a way that we, we, we don't give up our bodies in exchange for achieving a dream or a goal. That's how I coach, that's the work that we do, and that's what I believe. Folks, we're not as healthy as we think. We're not. We're not what we think. What I have a dream about is that that feeling you have at the finish line is the feeling that you can keep every day. That you won't wake up with aches and pains, that you'll be able to hike with your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that you won't have to make an excuse to your son. And there's my son right there, a student at Suffolk University. Hey, H, how you doing? Good to see you. Came over to see me today. That was nice of him, right? Pretty tough on a Saturday morning for a 20-year-old to get up. I can remember a day in my early Ironman days where I couldn't really spend time with him doing the things I wanted to because I was trying to recover from the workouts I was doing. I have a dream that the workouts you do for your health won't end up sacrificing your health. Yeah, so that's what my talk is about today, what I believe. And I hope you'll believe it as well. So what is movement? Today I'm talking about movement. Movement quality. Quality movement. What is it? Well, first of all, let's establish some things uh, in, in terms of a baseline. What is movement? Movement is what you're doing right now, sitting. Movement is, is standing. Movement is breathing. Movement is habitual learning. Most people think movement is what I do in sport. It's, it's walking. I mean, I have to be moving to identify movement, and that's not true. Movement is literally what you do, because even in standing, your pelvis is in a certain position, your shoulders are in a certain position, and you're breathing a certain way. That's movement. And that's important to remember because it impacts everything that we do. And most importantly, see if this thing works. Can you see that? Barely. I'll talk about patterns in a second, but this is critical in this whole concept of movement to understand that motor learning, motor control, how our brains communicate with our bodies, our nervous system. We develop patterns of movement. You see it every day. You're all sitting in a certain way. That's a pattern. Where your shoulders are, where your head is, how you walk and run, those are patterns. And those patterns are grooved 
as part of your motor learning, your motor control. So if we want to enhance movement, we've got to understand we've got to change the patterns. We've got to change the patterns. This is not about strengthening a muscle or lengthening a muscle. This is about addressing imbalances and addressing patterns. Okay? So what is quality movement? You know, thanks to folks like Gray Cook and Thomas Myers, who I'll talk about in a second, the work in our lab every day involves going back to what we consider to be authentic movement. How many of you have children in the room? How many of you have ever seen a baby in a crib? Excellent. Did you ever notice how when babies are born, man, they're hypermobile. They can move their joints in any which way, but they can't necessarily stand and jump very well. They learn that over time, right? So that mobility that they're born with and the stability that they earn and develop over time is often what we have to go back to to get back to authentic movement. So quality movement is authentic. It's holistic. Balance is a word that I use every day. What does it mean? I'm not talking about standing on a BOSU here, folks. Not at all. I'm talking about basic muscular skeletal balance, the front and the back of your bodies, inside and out. Without balance, things don't work really well. First and foremost, when we talk about quality movement, it's balance. Okay? It's minus compensation and dysfunction. I talk about compensation all the time in our lab. Actually, compensation is normal. If you have a traumatic brain injury, and you work with a, a, a team of physical therapists and doctors, you can actually learn to compensate incredibly well. And that's miraculous. But if you're an athlete that wants to be the best that you can be, compensation's not a good thing. Do I want my quadratus lumborum doing the work of my glute? Do I want my rotator cuff doing the work of my latissimus dorsi when I swim? No way. No way. We don't want that compensation. Quality movement is minus those things. And dysfunction, of course, we're talking about injury. Quality movement is a moving target. How many of you, raise your hands, if your, your bodies feel different after a four-hour bike ride than they felt before the four-hour bike ride? Raise your hands. Thank you. All right, so we got some honest people in a room. Super. How many of you will admit that your bodies feel a little different after you've sat at your desk at work for six hours. Yeah? Okay. So I know when I take off on my car and I drive to Washington, D.C. tomorrow that my body is going to be different when I get out of the car than it was when I got in. Movement, movement, quality movement is a moving target and it's always changing and always changing in response to our training, to our lifestyle. So when someone comes to Pursuit Athletic Performance and they get a gait analysis or a movement analysis and we address where their dysfunction or compensation may be, we don't say, oh, you're one and done. Go do 12 Ironmans and come back and see us in 20, 20 years. You understand that as your training evolves, your loads change, your methods change, you adapt differently to different workouts, that movement changes. You have to understand what it is in order to know. Okay, part of quality movement is appropriate mobility and stability. So I want to talk about that for just a second. Let's identify mobility. The ability for joints to move freely, right? Without restriction, very simple. And if you're a triathlete, you need mobile hips. You need, your hips need to be able to move freely and easily. If they don't move, something else is going to, and it may be your low back or lumbar spine, not a good thing. You need mobile shoulders, of course, mobile ankles in order to get appropriate dorsiflexion and plantar flexion during the running stride, right? But we want certain joints to not be very mobile, right? We don't want our knee joint to be mobile in this direction, yes? No, not a good thing. Okay, so that's mobility. It's related to flexibility, but it's not the same thing. Not the same thing. Stability, what does that mean? You know, this is very interesting topic for me because very often in my experience we mix strength and stability. Stability while it begins with an ST and strength while it begins with an ST, not the same thing at all. What is stability? 
I define stability as controlling or dampening motion in one place in the presence of motion somewhere else. Simply put, and I thought this picture was really cool. Thank you, Dr. Strecker, my partner, for giving me this. We got the crew boats. How many saw the crew boats coming into town today? Right? Harvard, MIT, BC, BU. I'm still paying BU for my daughter's education. She graduated like 12 years ago. He's breaking me too. All right. Stability is motor control. Stability is timing. How good is that boat if those guys don't operate together? Exactly, precisely together. How important is the strength of each one of them if they're not working together? Not very good. Do you all, this, is, this is an interesting photograph, and I don't know if I can get my pointer to actually show up here. That cartoonish figure is literally a couple of vertebra, and those red figures represent tiny little muscles that are literally the size of a shoestring. Are you all aware that all of those muscles hold your spine together? That's stability. We take a spine out of a cadaver, all right, take all of the muscles off of that spine, 20 pounds will blow that thing to smithereens. So what's creating the stability for that spine? Muscles. And if those muscles, which are the size of a shoestring, don't turn on at the right time, is the glute going to do it? Is the quad going to do it? Do we want the quad doing the job of those tiny little muscles? No, we don't. Stability is critical. And I will tell you, whether it's an elite athlete or a novice athlete, whether it's an Ironman athlete who's won her age group three consecutive times in Kona, and who's the fastest 40-plus Ironman female in the world in the amateur world, or a novice, we see di dysfunctional compensated stability every day. It has to be trained at a very, very basic level, folks. If you're rolling a tire around in the gym thinking you're training stability, or if you're standing on a BOSU trying to balance and your body's going all over the place, you're not training stability. You're training how to struggle on something that throws you out of balance. Really, really important. And of course, interesting little picture of a spine here, kind of broken up a little bit. There we go. We can, so we can see what happens. You know, a lot of disc injuries and other issues. And again, remember what I said in the beginning. This is about protecting your body. And this isn't just about injury. This is about going fast, because in a minute I'll talk about energy leak, power generation, all of those things. If your base isn't stable, if this isn't rock solid so this can move freely, I don't care whether you're a swimmer or a cyclist or a runner, then you're losing energy. Energy's going away, because this is your base. How many of you canoe or row? Raise your hands. Yes? Some of you got to get out in the boat. It's fun out there. All right, so I row my rowboat up to a dock. I don't tie it off and I step out. Where do I go? But if I tie it firmly to the dock, rigid, strong, I step out confidently and I have power when I step out. Yes? That's stability. That's stability. Okay. Now I want to give you a couple of visual representatives, and this, the video is darker than I anticipated uh, it was going to be. This is a before video. This is Linda Patch. Linda's in the room somewhere. Raise your hand. There you are, sweetie. This is before. This is after. Look at the difference in the video. This is stability in action. Someone that came to us broken and injured and losing power, and after our training, nice, unstable, let me see if I can get this to work, there we go, unstable, imbalanced, poor muscular skeletal stacking and alignment, strong, solid, and rigid, someone that went from being broken. Here's another example, this is a little bit different, okay, on the right, I'm sorry, I apologize for the before being on the right. Look at the tilt in her pelvis. Unstable, imbalanced front and back. This is after video. Look at the changes. Folks, these changes don't happen consciously. Let's just lay that out there right now. 
Someone says, oh, you need your hips need to be forward and you need to fire your butt more, your butt needs to be stronger. You're really going to do that 1,500 times in a mile? Because that's what a mile is of running. The changes that you see here are not conscious changes. They're unconscious because we can't consciously fire our stabilizers, can we? Think about it. I can fire my quad as I extend my knee, but can I fire my QL? Can I fire my glute med or my TA or my oblique? No, it has to be trained. And it means going back and restoring that authentic movement. All right, so one more time. This is one of the simplest phrases I ever heard Gray Cook say. But I think it's one of the most profound. And if you leave here with anything today, I hope it's this thought. We are tight because of how we move and weak because of how, how we move. And you may be thinking, coach, what does that mean? What does that mean? Our movement creates the issues that you're struggling with, folks. Your movement's doing it. Were you born with IT band syndrome? I don't think so. How you're moving is facilitating the issue, as an example. Okay? So if you don't change the movement, even if you go to PT, or if you're looking to get faster, it's the same thing. It's no different injury or speed. Same thing. If you go to PT to try to fix that IT band syndrome issue, but you run the same way with the same perhaps compensated stability or lack of appropriate mobility somewhere, the injury is not going away. It comes right back because it's the movement that creates it. All right, cool. How are we doing for time? You doing all right? So I'm going to yell at me if I, I run over. You guys doing, so, doing, doing okay so far? You know, today, I gotta be honest, not only do I have a dream, but I got a lot of courage, I think, because I'm bringing some concepts to you guys that are pretty cutting edge. You know, in the triathlon world, we don't talk about this very much. I think Jesse Stent, uh, Stenslin's gonna be out there in the expo today, and Jesse gets credit for being one of those pro triathletes who's actually thinking about movement and the work that she does, and Coach Mark Evans is another example. There are some people that are aware of this, but not enough. And it's my goal to change that and make our health and quality movement part of what we do so that we remain healthy and we can sustain what we do through our entire lives. All right, so I'm going to throw something kind of crazy at you, and I want you to follow along with me here. Hang in with me here, okay? I know this may seem a little bit like anatomy and physiology class, but I want to share with you one representation of what I'm talking about on a really profound level. And I'm going to ask a, a guest to join me in a moment to help me with this. So Anatomy Trains is a book that Thomas Myers wrote quite a few years ago. Myers redefined how we think about the human body, okay? We used to think of the human body as stacked. We used to think that the bones were held together, that, there was, that it was a lever system kind of a thing. What we know now is that the body is not like that at all. It's actually a tensegrity type structure. You may say, what does that mean? Well, if you want to see a tensegrity model, come to our booth. I got a little one I made up with the help of a friend. Tensegrity basically means continuous elastic elements or tension elements and discontinuous compression elements. Basically, we are a myofascial wrap with the bones and everything else, including organs, pressing up against that wrap. And we're connected in ways we can't even begin to fathom if we think about anatomy in a traditional way. Fascial tensegrity. Today, I'm going to do something that I think is pretty cool. I'm going to redefine what the core is, especially for a triathlete. I'm going to focus on one of Meyer's 12 myofascial lines, the deep front line. What is the deep front line? How many of you heard of Myers, by the way? anatomy trains. Raise your hand. All right. Timmy, of course. Coach Tim Crowley back there. Yeah. Thomas Myers identified 12 different myofascial lines. The deep front line is one of them. Okay, quickly, what is the deep front line? Starts with the tib posterior flexor hallucis, moves up into the interosseous membrane behind the kneecap into the adductor hiatus, these are psoas and QL back to back. This is your diaphragm up into the pericardium and then eventually to the tongue. 
That is a single line of pull of tension in your body that is connected. No, not connected the way you think. Oh, of course your body's connected. Coach, we get that. No, this is a single line of pull. What you guys, what I hope you get from this is that what's going on with your tip posterior, which is one of the most important muscles to support the arch of your foot, one of the most critical. What's going on with your tip posterior is directly connected to your tongue through your psoas, QL, and diaphragm. And what does that mean, diaphragm? What's the, what's the word that comes out in your minds when you hear diaphragm? Come on, quickly. Breathing. breathing. Thank you. Breathing. So now how we breathe is more profound than we ever thought before. Okay, let's go on. Now I want to ask to join me three-time consecutive Ironman age group world champion. The reigning 45 to 49 age group world champion. Resident of Barrington, uh, Rhode Island. Her husband's the best bike fitter on the planet, in my opinion. One of the nicest women and mom of three, Elizabeth Kenyon. A little round of applause for Liz. Come on. Thank you. Okay. Come on. Come join me. Okay. I thought it would be really cool today to use some pictures of Liz. Come here, please. Come and join me. She's shy. By the way, she's shy here. She's not shy in the race course, right? Ran herself into a little dehydration in Kona this year and suffered pretty good on the run. Still won her age group by 15 minutes. Pretty impressive. Okay. So everybody remember what that deep front line looks like? Toes, feet, calves, diaphragm, hip flexors. Up into the tongue. Okay. Think for a moment the lifestyle that we sit in. Okay? What's the position that we like to own on the bike? There's the position of Liz. And I'm going to show you a video of Liz in a second from the Gate Lab. Turn around this way. Look beautiful. It's easy. Think about this deep front line for a second. Okay? Think about where these tissues are. Okay? Liz lean in a little bit some stuff going on there. So here's, here's a video from 2010. This is in our lab. This is the first time that Liz visited the lab. And Liz and I started working together because I'm, I'm privileged beyond words to, to, to be able to coach Liz. What we're, what we're noticing here is you can see a lot of issues in her movement, a lot of compensation, not very good stability, not very good muscular balance. In fact, in this picture right here, if you can see it, and I apologize for how dark it is. Um, you can focus in on this position right here. You'll see Liz actually presents with quite an anterior tilt of her pelvis. She is not balanced in this position. What we, what we found out was that her hip flexors were very, very tight and her butt was not working very well. And she was already one of the best in the world. So I got so excited when I saw this. I was like, oh my God, she could be so much faster. Right? So much faster. So what I, what I really want to share with you guys today, Liz, show us how you might typically sit at the computer if you're not thinking about your posture. Right? Yeah. What about that position on the bike? Yes? How many of you sit in this position? How does it feel when you come off the bike and run? Kind of challenging, yes? Okay. Let's think about this for a second. Come over here, my dear. How many of you occasionally find yourself chest breathing? Not deep dia diaphragmatic breathing. Come on. Everybody chest breathes. We all wear our tension up in our shoulders, yes? Okay, what happens when we get into that chest breathing pattern? Or what if we're in the bike and we're in that forward rounded position? We get altered shoulder mechanics, all right? Shoulder blades are not stable not connected and working with the thoracic spine, which needs to be mobile. It needs to move. And in fact, in triathletes every day, I find triathletes whose thoracic spines don't move. This needs to move if you want to swim well and if you want to be healthy. So we get altered shoulder mechanics, risk of shoulder injury. Okay, that chest breathing feeds right up into the scalenes in the neck, can get triggered up, really refer up in some cases the carpal tunnel right? Headaches, a lot of other issues we all deal with. Come on, admit it, right? 
Not only that, but this chest breathing feeds into an interior tilt. We get tension or tightness through the erector spiny, okay, which then prevents the diaphragm being able to drop down where it needs to be. So in effect, our issues turn into a cyclical kind of thing where it now becomes harder to diaphragmatic breathe. Okay, if we move down the chain and where Liz presented with tight hip flexors, and this is a rule for all of us, how many of you ever spend any time sitting? Now, the, those of you that didn't raise your hands are going to, you know, you, I mean, you're, yeah. So, this imbalance in the front of the back of the hip from the hip flexors to the glutes, something which is important for you to remember, reciprocal inhibition, the relationship of an agonist and antagonist. When the front of our hips get, hips get tight, the brain's telling the backside to turn off. There's a relationship of strength and length that we cannot ignore. Okay, this anterior tilt of the pelvis changes the position of the femoral head and ends up affecting pronation. And I talked about the tib posterior, right? This important muscle under the arch of the foot. What I want to share with you, and thank you, Liz, what I want to share with you is it's all related. How many of you have ever had a calf injury? Be honest. Thank you. Calf injuries are rampant in our sport, rampant in running. Everybody's had a calf issue. Do you now understand that the calf issue in some way could be related to your breathing? to the QL or the psoas, to some issue in that regard. Okay, another example of imbalance, triathlete Rich Markowitz. This is his original video. Look at his posture. Everybody see his forward head? Can you imagine what his deep front line looks like here? This is an after video after Rich went through the training that we gave him. Look at the difference in his posture. Now, those of you who are never going to be injured and have never been injured, do you think he's more, more powerful and faster with his improved posture than he was before? You better believe it. What about energy leak? What about the amount of energy that's being expended through his upper back and neck just to keep his head over his spine? You don't think that's going to matter when he gets to mile 15 in Lake Placid this year? You better believe it's going to matter. Absolutely. Okay. So what have we learned from Liz? What have we learned from her experiences? First of all, if you're, comp if you're her competition, you've learned that she's addressed these issues and she's continuing to. So she's getting faster. She's 46. Had to throw that in there, sweetie. She's faster now than she's ever been. How many of you can say that? That's the truth. We can be faster when we get to be that age if we're moving well if we address compensation and dysfunction and fix it so that the prime movers move us and the stabilizers stabilize, right? She's faster. What have we learned? It's holistic, folks. We, we are total. There, there, there's no such thing as a core training exercise. There's no such thing as an arm exercise or a back exercise. Everything is everything. Everything is everything. We are connected in ways that we never understood but now we're beginning to understand. Completely holistic. The human body is a union job. You maybe say, oh, well, what does that mean? Everything has got its role. And when we ask tissues to do a job that it wasn't designed to do, it doesn't like it. It doesn't like it very much. Liz, did, did you have a little discomfort in your quadratus because of the position of your pelvis and the amount of work you were asking it to do? Not just a little. Not just a little. Everybody remember that picture of her and how she was leaning? We all think that's cool, right? That's heroic when somebody goes to the finish line like that, right? I don't. I don't think that's heroic. We know you're tough. You're doing a sport that 99.9% .9 of people on, on the planet wouldn't even attempt. Don't show me you're tough by running through injury or moving poorly. That's not tough. That's kind of crazy. Move well, be healthy. You know what? One thing, and you may be able to address this, recovery, oh my God. I can tell you honestly, I'd swear on a stack of Bibles. The athletes that I've had the opportunity to work with who are moving better, 
recover so much faster, it's ridiculous. You're not shredding little muscles anymore. Okay. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Three things. Three things. Breathe authentically. Understand as you leave here today that how you breathe impacts movement. It's not, I mean, listen, the yogis t tried to tell us this and they've known it for 3,000 years, right? We've got to connect our breath to how we move. Today I want you to understand that the diaphragm is part of that deep front line. It's connected to your psoas and the QL at your lumbar spine that how you breathe truly affects how you run in ways you didn't understand. Learn how to breathe authentically. Okay. Start to address the imbalance in the front and the back of your hips. Now this is a stretch that most people do, but most do incorrectly. What do I mean? By the way, people ask me, what do I think of stretching? Is it good or bad? And I go, yes. <laughs> stretching, in my experience, is about addressing balance. If somebody presents to me as perfectly balanced, I don't have to have those folks stretch. Why would I have them stretch a hamstring if it's an appropriate length? However, with imbalances comes specific stretching to address the imbalances. We're all unique in here. One of the biggest injustices, and I don't want to throw middle school gym teachers under the bus, but when I have 20 kids in a gym class all doing the same stretch, that's not right. Mary, who's got really long hip rotators, and Johnny, who's got really tight hip rotators, should not be doing the same stretch. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is the correct way to stretch that hip flexor. The thing that you can't see in this picture, which is the most important thing, is he's squeezing his glute like crazy. He's firing his glute. We're going to use reciprocal inhibition to gain length in a tissue. We're going to say if we contract the muscle, we can get length on the opposite side of the joint. Does that make sense? So if you're stretching your hip flexor just by pulling on it, all you're doing is initiating that stretch reflex getting your body to fight you, and you're never going to get any benefit from the stretch. This is another way to think of active isolated stretching, to use reciprocal inhibition to our benefit. So with this stretch, perfect posture, his pelvis is in neutral, here he's leaning, there's no neutral, he's just feeding into the compensation, not firing his glute. Here everything is in perfect alignment. Neutral pelvis, neutral pelvis, neutral pelvis in everything that you do in every kind of training that you do. If you do any exercise and you're out of neutral, you're most likely not going to get the benefit from that exercise in a really profound sport specific way, which is the only way that matters. Okay, take a look at this little video. Kudos to Mark, by the way, for in his presentation earlier where we talked about the feet. The feet are critical. One of the greatest issues that we see every day, especially in middle-aged triathletes or older, are bunions. Who the heck wants those things? Right? Why does a bunion happen? Because the intrinsic muscles of the foot, specifically the adductor hallucis, start to weaken, the bones start to spread apart, and now we've got dysfunctional feet. And if the small foot muscles, the intrinsic muscles of the foot, are not doing their job, what's going to happen to the tip posterior? A lot of calf injuries happen because our feet are weak. Now we're asking the tip posterior to do the work of it, plus the muscles in the feet. So what, what is Doc doing here? Let's go back for a second. Let's watch this video one more time. He's literally creating the arch while being able to move his toes freely. Everybody should try this, and if you want to be coached through this exercise, come to our, come to our booth. It's a lot harder than it looks. And if you got bunions, you can, reduce, you can reverse them. You can literally change the direction of those bunions. Pretty cool. And without strengthening your feet, you will have issues all the way up the chain. Remember the deep front line. Okay, if these muscles are not working well, what happens to the tip posterior? It gets, it gets ticked off. That affects what happens every, every, every other way, all the way up the chain. Really profound, really powerful. Okay. I'm sorry? Absolutely. Let's go back one more time and go forward. So he's literally creating an arch. He's not picking up a towel. This is not about using the toes at all. This is about literally creating an arch, almost having a feeling of 
drawing up sand in the middle of your arch. Training those very small intrinsic muscles of the foot to just do their job. By the way, I will be perfectly honest with you folks. If I go out and start walking around in my sandals or barefooted, do those muscles get retrained? No, they don't. They don't automatically start working. They don't. The only way we get that function back is by retraining those muscles to do their job. Okay, what are the training and racing implications? I got two more slides, I think I'm doing okay time-wise. We'll hopefully have a couple of minutes for questions. Bottom line is, folks, in my opinion, you, you know this is about injury. I told you I had a dream. Seven out of ten runners are injured in a calendar year. I don't want any of you to be injured. I want you to enjoy your sport, recover fast, enjoy life, play with your kids, and be as good as you can be, right? So we know it impacts injury. We know it impacts endurance. You can't go farther if you're hurt, and as you go farther, the effects of gravity and ground reaction impact you. Efficiency, it's obvious. If you've got a lot of tissues doing work they're not supposed to, you're not efficient. In my opinion, where this really impacts us is two things, recovery and speed. If you really want to get fast, the only way you get fast is to get the prime movers working like crazy. And in running, we're talking about your butt. I'm known as the butt guy. Right? I mean, I'm looking at butts all day. It's a pretty cool gig, guys. You know, it's a pretty cool gig. Right? So I, I love helping people get their butt stronger. Listen, if you want to get fast, you've got to get compensation out of the system and get rid of dysfunction, okay? And recovery. Recovery, recovery, it's, it's what it's all about, you know? It, you'll get faster when you can recover better. How many of you have you ever done the best half Ironman of your life or the best Olympic distance race of your life and you couldn't race again for another month and a half? Not a single one? You all coming back and racing fast? Oh, come on, nobody wants to admit it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been coaching for a lot of years. I know what it's all about. You know, you should be able to come back a week later and race fast again. Or really, actually get into training two to three days later if you're not shredding small tissues. Okay. So here's my call to action to all you guys. Okay? And by the way, thank you again for coming. Thank you again for coming. First of all, let's stop the insanity. This is true, by the way. This is not marketing. In the last three weeks, four runners have presented to our gate lab, four of them, all with knee pain, three out of the four, meniscal tears, one a meniscal and ACL tear, and they all kept running through the pain. And they all wanted to know when they could run again. And we were like, no, guess what? You're going to see the guy with the sharp toys. Stop this running through pain, folks. It's not normal. Running with pain is not normal. I'm not talking about the gut-busting kind of pain that Liz shows us crossing the Ironman finish line. I'm talking about the pain that you all know is not normal and not healthy. Stop it. Trust your intuition. Your intuition will tell you. And if, guys, if you don't have a real good intuition, talk to the women in your life. They are smarter than you. Except when it comes to running. Then they're, they're just as dumb as we are. <laughs> know yourself. You're unique. Every person moves in a different way. Every person has different imbalances. Every, every person has different issues. Know yourself. Where are your issues? Liz came to the lab to find out she had issues. She addressed them. Right? And we were work, recently working with an offensive lineman with the Oakland Raiders, Zach Hurd. He had issues too getting ready to head back to camp. Everybody's unique, everybody's different. Invest in yourself. Stop looking for quick fixes to getting fast. There's no secret. There's no magic workout. There's no shoe you can put on your feet or shoe you can take off your feet. Stop looking for the fast wheel set that costs you 1500 bucks to give you three minutes when I'm telling you, if you start to move well and use your butt, you'll get a quarter of an inch of stride length just like that, authentically, and that's 10 to 15 seconds a mile. How's that? How many of you are slowing down in the end of your races because your heart rate's too high? Not too many. It's the chassis we're talking about here. The chassis. Address the chassis. Invest in yourself. Okay, 
Any questions? I don't know if we have time. Do we have time? We're out of time. One question? All right, one question. Who's got one? Super, no questions. Oh, do we have one? Don't forget. Um, do we have a question or no? Okay. Don't forget to see the folks with clipboards. Basically, what they're going to do is get your email address and they'll send you some additional information that will follow up on my talk today. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Have a great day.